happening? What's happening in the YouTube world? Shout out to the Dirty Nation. We got a uh, Flacco here, Convict's Perspective. Actually, we kind of both here. Like, we on both channels. So we talking to, like, two different crowds at the same time. Because this is just, like, one of them general conversations that needs to be had. Where somebody asks the tough questions and somebody answers them. And we, or we both answer them. But it's, uh, it's, it's questions that need to be answered. So first off, man, how was your new, how was your uh, Christmas and things? Man, it was pretty, it's pretty chill, man. I didn't do too much, man. Um, Just been uh, focused on everything revolving around my court case right now. I go to court next week. So we're getting to that point right now where, where either we, we go to trial or, you know what I'm saying, I take a deal. Man, I don't, hey, like I, I don't wish, I don't wish jail on my worst enemy. No. Like for real. It's different nowadays too. You know? Yep. So uh, how's your channel going? It's been doing better. It's been like since November, I kind of went a whole different direction. I just started dropping stuff. You know what I mean? I figured, you know what? I got to treat this like a full-time job. Instead of just doing like two hours work and just dropping one video, let me just keep start dropping stuff on every channel. You know what I'm saying? Multiple videos, two, three videos sometimes a day. And sometimes I get a, I get a good uh, algorithm kick. Sometimes you don't. You know how yeah. it goes. And um, it's been decent the last two months, you know? Mm -hmm. And for those of y'all that don't know, who was the first person that gave you an interview? PNG News Media. PNG News Media. Shout out to PNG. One of the hardest working men behind the scenes. Most definitely. You know what I mean? He, he deserves a lot more credit than people give him, man. And he won't take the credit. He'll be humble about it. It's a good dude right there. Yeah, for real. All right, so uh, first of all, how loud is that in the background? Is that real you sound, loud? No, nah, you, you sound good. All right, so one of the things that you guys are going to see in the, in the uh, title is a reaction to you know, Dub's video, and even somewhat a reaction to Toon's video, cartoon video. Shout out to him, shout out to Dub's. But there's just some things that were said that needs clarification. But we're going to do it in a way that, where well, we ain't directing it, we ain't addressing it directly, but we are. So we're going to pose this in some questions of some true and false, true and false things, true and false questions. And we're gonna ask these Flacco, and some of them he gonna flip back on me, but it is what it is. So let's get into it, man. Let's do it. First off, man, true or false? Everyone on the level two yards or S and Y or on 50-50 yards. Look, pretty much, right? I think there's only um one or two prisons that actually a level two yard where they're good. Solano, I think there's two level twos in Solano, of course, because I've been to Solano that are still good. And I think uh, Folsom, um, everywhere else, you know, it's pretty much, like I said, it depending on what group you run with, what's going to be acceptable. I don't think there's no northerners that are really going to be on any level two yard except for Solano and Folsom, right? And, South and size, they're taking, they about to take Solano. Yeah. They about to take Solano and flip it, and everybody. So they the plan that they got for everybody that's that's uh not conforming, quote unquote. They forcing them to them yards that don't want to conform, and replacing them with people that do. Well, by so, nine months. And so one of the things that that Dub said in this video is is see, I, I and people might expect me to come on here and disagree. With a lot of the stuff Dub said, but truth for the matter is, a lot of that stuff is true, especially yeah. when it comes to prison nowadays. People yeah. want to go home; they tired of uh, them calendars, uh, and them holidays passing by, and, and dealing with the them, uh, you know, holiday phone calls once, you know, on Christmas Day where you ain't there. You got to talk to your family. Hi, right, Uncle Tony, and you ain't seen none of these relatives in twenty years. Eventually, at some point, you want to come home. No, most definitely, man. It's, it's a it's a different type of environment, man. You know, um, what about what about for the blacks? Are the blacks able to program these level two yards? 
What's the yeah, political well, politics I, like? Man, I know some gangsters that's on these level two yards, and I doubt anybody will say anything to them when they come home about that. It's just easy. It's just easy to uh to put this label on people that are on these yards, and really they don't know their situation. So when it comes to blacks, yeah, there's a, some blacks that'll fly under the radar for sure. Yeah, I've experienced that myself. I mean, I, I mean, I went to uh, San Luis Obispo, CMC East, which was all bad, right? But yeah. there was act, there was active blacks on the yards that were there for for a while, and they actually came in for uh, removing one of their own. You know what I'm saying? There's a couple of yeah. cats that were out there that were still active. You know what I mean? So it was a little bit different. So what's in my opinion is like this: whatever's going on with the north, south, whites, or blacks, that's their people's decision to make that choice. It shouldn't affect everybody else. So you can't put a label on a whole other group because your group says this. This only applies to your group. All right, so I got family that's on these, that's on 50-50 yards. And I hate to say it, but I don't judge them for being on these yards because you got to think about it, man. People is catching gun charges. All they're getting is like eight mo 18 months or something like that. That's level one, level two time. So automatically... When they go in, they are forced to go to these 50-50 yards because they don't really know about the politics like that. And they've been home, you know, living life and stuff, and they just want to get back to it. So yeah. they, so with this short time, you're basically saying if you don't kill somebody and, and go to the level four yards and you catch some punk stuff, then you're going to prison and you're going to be on a 50-50 yard and your career is over. That's that's what that's virtually what they said. Do I agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. I, I agree with progressive thinking, and I've heard it both sides. I've heard both sides, both sides. And and fortunately for me, I left prison in 2018 before the uh, before the change, and the the great change happened at or around 2018. You know, it, it kind of brings me back to back in the days, right? Um, I remember when they first started doing this. They started putting out filters, which is like a kite that goes out to different locations. That, oh, this prison is no good. If you're a northerner, you have to take off within 72 hours. No one was ever cross-checking where these orders were coming from. They were hardly ever coming from Pelican Bay headquarters at the time. So when we were, out, we were on the sixth yard, which is the validated yard in San Quentin, right? A lot of a lot of cats NF structure all in these yards, right? And we we're talking about like, well, how are we ever going to establish a yard if we treat every yard as bad and we just get there and take off? We're not going to have any yards to go to. Yeah. You know, they're going to keep on sending us all over the place. And we're like, look at our yard right there. There's about 15 of us solid that if we would have went to that any one of those prisons, we could have established it for ourselves. You know what I mean? So that's the thing I, I didn't understand. You know, and now they're doing that with level two, level ones, where you would think. Man, let your people get some. Let your people go out there, and go to fire camp, and make some money, get some trades, eat good. So what? What era? What era is this that we're speaking of? Mid two, mid two thousands when they started to have a, a little bit of restriction on the on the fire camps, right? I remember that. Yeah, late 90s, because two thousand five was a pivotal time. Like I always say, that that was a time when when we felt the uh, the breakdown of the relationships with the northerners began. Around that time, yeah, it's, I think it started a little bit earlier. Just, um, but there started to be a little bit of incidents that started to occur. But the whites and southerners were going at it too, though. That was kind of raw too. They were going at it over there in AC. It started over there in AC in San Quentin with the uh, with the the big homies of that faction, right? The whites yeah. and the southerners. They had their little conflict and they went to war. And that started to spread out to all the different prisons. And all of a sudden, now all of a sudden you, you didn't have regular woods in the system. You had people that were P9s. You had people that were skinheads. You didn't have that back in the 90s. Everybody, you know I mean? what, what, everybody was one? Well, no. I mean, most of those I went to, I mean, there was no factions like that. They were very, they were very small. It, within like a year, you started seeing everybody shaving their heads, and they were starting to claim these different factions within the white, white collective. That's interesting. So before that, you're saying basically either you was a you was an A B or a Nazi or you was a regular wood. I don't you that's how I remember it. 
But it started changing in 2001. You start 99, they started validating the NLR. Then the P9s came out. Then you started having the the uh, the warrior skinheads. Then you started having the uh, the wolf packs. And you had the you know you had the sacramaniacs back then, right? But they just pretty much were even a smaller faction. You know what I mean? But now, no, now hey. you had all, all these groups that were different, and their, their programming was different. Because I remember they used to all have long hair and shit. You know, that was the way the woods used to dress and look in yeah. prison back then. They didn't have this uh, uh, shaved head and certain tattoos that they didn't have now. I promise you, when I was 18 and Tracy in the reception, the first group of woods that I knew to respect was the Sacramaniacs, because they was easily identifiable. Yeah. Sacramento Yaks was tatted from head to toe. Head to toe. Beards and all that like that. <laughs> head to toe. That's how you knew a Sacramento Yak. Like you think these motherfuckers tatted now? Like they they was the they invented that shit in prison. Tattooing your whole body. I remember that. Hey, so so I went I recently went into Old Folsom, right? Uh, about three weeks ago now to play softball against the inmates. This is the same prison that I walked out of in 2018. And so now seeing the difference, one of the first differences I noticed is it was Northerners in this prison. I actually, that was my third time. I, well, that was my second time. And then my third time was a few weeks ago. But I'm talking about when I first went, I'm like, wow, there's Northerners in Old Folsom. And I have been there twice. I was there from 0, 0, uh, 06 to 2010, and I was there from uh, from 16 to 18. No, no, 17 to 18. Mm -hmm. And there was never no Northerners because back in the days, there was a warden that set the Northerners up, basically, and let the he let the South Siders slaughter him. He, he let a, a group of Northerners out, let them walk out on the yard, and for them to get to where they was had to go, they had to pass the southerners area and so what happened is the warden they got they got the warden's office that sits up high a little bit oh then overlooks the yard and so they had him on recording giving a play-by-play -play, like watch this watch the northerners about to walk over there watch this yeah boom yeah and, and like he was looking yeah. forward anticipating this and from that day forward i think that was like 2002 2003 from that day forward there was no northerners at at el Folsom. Fast forward, they had Northerners there. Yeah, that that's um. I remember that incident you're talking about. Before in the nineties, there used to be a lot of homeboys that were there, but Folsom's always been traditionally a, a South Side stronghold, a Mexican mafia stronghold in the eighties as well. So mm -hmm. um, they've always wanted to have that prison. To them, it's like part of their history, you know, part of where they're from, you know. So um, I get that though. I think the wardens were probably working with them for probably a fucking long time because it was not it was not back in the 80s and 90s Folsom wasn't really good for the blacks either it was hard over there yeah you know? yeah it, it, it man look it's a lot of history in that prison and, and i promise you as the people that are on the prison ministry softball league that i'm in literally i was giving them a tour of this prison like simple shit like like look Brooklyn up County? look up in the roof look up in the roof you see them holes in the roof they was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That come from there was there used to be like warning shots. Like if there was gonna fight, the first thing they do is bust that mini in the roof. Boom! Like like shoot it in the air. So if it's going down in the building, it's the bullets is in the roof, and you just see holes all throughout. And them holes come from a whole different time. But right, and then we also showed them the hanging room where they used to hang people in old Folsom. Yeah. And like in old Folsom Five building, that's the old death row. And then I was, I show them the only person to escape from old Folsom, like the 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 area they covered it up. The manhole that he got up out of, they covered it up. But I used to do uh landscaping out there, so I knew where it was. So I was able to point that out to him. But yeah, man, it's a lot of history in old Folsom. All right, man. So let's get back to let's get back to this this uh, dubs and, and cartoon thing because there's some questions like I say that we need to ask. Dubs is saying La Raza applies to the Northerners because they came. They're claiming something that came from the South. Now that's a tough question. You ain't you ain't got to answer if you don't want to. 
But that was a mouthful. That was but, literally saying that to but, me. But, much respects, much respects to Dubs. But I have to, I have to respond to that one like this. And much respect to Dubs. It didn't come from the south. It came from oppression. It came from the Mexican mafia pushing the will upon regular uh, Mexicanos and oppressing them and oppressing their rights and trying to dictate the program and be superior and pretty much run run a program that thrived upon its own people, sweat and blood, taking advantage of people. That's where the NF came from. It didn't come from Southern California. Some of its original members were from Southern California, but it came from oppression. They okay, so, really with, really so, really with, so with so with respects to what angle Dubs was trying to go with that, because to me it looked like he was saying like, "Hey, y'all, y'all kick back because you know now we family, and y'all y'all understand what it is we made y'all." And so fall back on this issue. I'm speaking to the ones from from Southern California, the La Raza. Like, what is what? I, that's for the outside looking in. So how do you feel about like when he say La Raza applies to to y'all in this situation, but fall back? In what situation? As far as the uh, what do you mean by that though? As far as the the uh, Southern arrogance, because that's that was the name of his video. I uh, you know what I don't I don't believe that because that wasn't the teachings that we received. See, we're 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 two different entities. You know what I'm saying? Uh. There are members, there was members that came from Southern California. Some of them were former MA members. You know what I'm saying? That's a fact. All these early members were from Southern California. But most of them were from outside of the main central area, the rural areas, the areas that didn't get respect because they went from like the main city LA. You get so what I'm saying? What do you think, what, so what do you think he means by that? I know this is a tough question, but like what I'm, do you think he means? Because there's people, it's some people that felt like like they got, I don't know, put in their place. I don't know, man. I, but just what do you think he meant by, by y'all? When I say La Raza, it, it applies to 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 fit to uh, Hispanics from the north too. Well, he's he's doing that in a respectful term, but as far as okay, the Raza, that's that what they represent. La Raza is basically a cultural thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like we we represent La Raza Norteña when I was growing up, the northern race. Right, we didn't represent the Rasa as far as overall collective, you know. Um, mm. like they have a different agenda, you know, and they're gonna have their beliefs that they want to put upon people, which is understandable. As far as where I come from, we're gonna have the ways we were trained and how we perceived it. So we can only have what he perceived and how he was taught. I have how I was perceived and how I was taught, which is different from the carnales I learned from, which I'm sure is different from the carnales he learned from, you know. But yeah, it's basically, yeah. we all come from, we all come from basically. Like I said, almost the same uh, uh, lineage. You know what I mean? There was a lot yeah. of dudes, like like one of the first dudes to write the NF Constitution, right, was a, a, a dude named uh, Lou Rao. He was a former Mexican Mafia member that stepped back. Okay, because in, in 62, there was, they made it a blood oath, and several members stepped away because they didn't want to make that commitment. Some of them later on became NF members. You know, so there is history with Southern California with the NF. That's a fact. But the Norte Sue thing is something totally different. That didn't come into play till like 79, 78. And you started to see the early rumblings around 74, 73. But it didn't so take when, when, did the, when did the situation with the boots happen? That happened in 68, but that had nothing to do with North or South. Nothing. But you but have you heard the rumors or the, or just through the through your life where they say that the be that the separation started then? That's what they call the straw that broke the camel's back. There was actually a couple of incidents that happened before that. Uh, Phil Neri, Rebel, a um, couple other cats that got hit, a couple that died. Now, the shoe incident was like, okay, they were already planning and organizing themselves for a long time, right? They had a little um, newsletter that they had over there. And so that wasn't just the NF that was supposed to be involved. This is what people don't know. It was three groups. It was the NF, which at that time was uh, uh, under clandestine operations at the time. The second wave was supposed to be Maravilla, which is a gang from Southern California. The third wave was supposed to be the El Paso tip, which is a Texas car. All three of those groups combined together to go against the Mexican mafia on that yard because of how they were treating their people. Yeah. So the NF was able to take care of what they needed to take care of. There wasn't that many Mexican mafia members left after that incident. And uh, 
in the chaos, there was one individual that died. Some people say he's a member, some say he's an associate. If you ask any Mexican mafia member, they're never going to really admit that any of their uh, members got killed except for the one, Cheyenne. They're always going to say he's an associate or this and that, but there's a lot of stuff that could prove up else, elsewise, right? But um, yeah, that's how that shoe incident happened. The stuff with the North and South, those groups created it. The NF and MA. They're the ones that kind of created that and it became a recruiting tool to add to this so war. When they say, so when they say farmers, the guys up north are farmers, there were Mexican mafias in, mixed in with them farmers that formed northern Northeans? There was Mexican mafia members in the beginning that were from up north, Sacramento and San Francisco, believe it or not. You know, um, at the time when they started, see, they were about having the best of the best, the fucking most ruthless, fucking ferocious killers. They wanted to be a super gang. They didn't, they didn't start their gang to go against any other groups as far as being oppressed or anything. Every other group was established off the threat of oppression. Every group. Yeah. You know, someone was trying to oppress the other group. So what, what happens is every cause, every movement is built off the threat of oppression. So that's how the NF was created, off the threat of oppression. Okay, so let me ask you this. Let's switch to a different question because it's a lot of stuff he said that made sense, but I didn't know. So the difference between a Serenio and a Southsider, like I really saw no difference because in my mind, if one go, they all going to go. And that's what I've seen. If one go, they all going to go. So they all Southsiders, they all 13s, they all Serenios in my mind. But well, what he broke down was a difference between a Southsider and a Serenio. Like how is that possible that they're separate? Well, you know what, man? I don't know when they started to change things, but if you look at all throughout history with the North Daniels and Sudanels, there was new laws, new ways that applied, right? And where he's a Southerner is just someone that's from Southern California. That's part, he could be from the hood, and he represents the South Side. He's there to defend his people, whatever. A Sudanel is someone that pretty much is like, say, like the other states, they call them like Esquinas, right? Which they're the front, front line soldiers. They're trying to become become Mexican Mafia members. They're the ones that are taking over the yards when there's no enemy member there. They're the ones that may be a secretary for a Mexican Mafia member. They're entrusted, and they're expected to do whatever's asked of them. If they're told, hey, you know what, go stab that dude, they're going to go stab that dude and kill him because they're, they're like the elite of the Southsiders. Yeah. You know? You'll see with certain tattoos like, uh, you know, G-Shields and other type of tattoos, and that's they've had to learn those. Right? Was there a time that you think that Serenio and Southsider got blurred to where, or was it blurred on purpose to where people didn't understand the difference? Well, the, from, from my our era right in the 90s, right, none, none of these groups were as organized as they are today. None of them. The Southsiders were not as organized. They just started to make a lot of changes at that time, and so so did the, um, the NF and the structure. We all made changes. Different things happened throughout the years that certain things stuck and other things didn't. Like at one time there was an SSG, right? Southside government, which had a lot to do with Vessi, a dude Vessi from 18th Street. They were the ones, the first ones to start enforcing the taxes. And it was all about collecting money out there in the streets, but it started to transition into prison, but the MA shut it down real quick. So for a while, we were, we were looking at everybody as SSG members. But they were, and traditionally they were just camaradas, they were just sureños. They weren't SSG. So we were kind of misled with the information that we had as well. Just like they had a lot of misleading information about the North as well. So, you know, I, as far as like their politics, you know, to be a Sudanio is, is someone's recognizing them. Someone's putting them under their wing. And therefore, they're going to be expected to do certain things. That's the difference. You know, um, I, that's kind of what 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 uh, that's kind of what uh, Doves was getting in, getting at when he was letting it be known. Like, yeah, man, like even me coming into prison, I knew off top like Southsiders. They are a different breed. They are unlike any other race that I've encountered growing up in Northern California and, and, and being from Sacramento. Like, this is a force right here. This almost reminded me of the Borg, like Star Trek. Or is this, yeah, Star Trek, the Borg, yeah. like one head. And, and if you get into it with them, they all going to go. Like, ain't going to be no thing. And one of the things he was talking about is like, he said that, and this is what really probably struck a nerve, probably amongst amongst blacks, because it did with me. But I understood where he was coming from. So, so go with me on this. Okay. So he said that 
that in a in an all out war, blacks would lose against the La Raza or the Southsiders or whatever he said. Because remember, I look at them all as one. I don't see no difference. So he said that that we would lose. So I had to think about it when he said that all the beasts, all the frontliners, all the ones that's gonna tear that motherfucker up, they gonna be on the first wave. And so what's the what does that leave? That leaves like, you know, the OGs, the ones, the OGs and the sprinkle of gangsters that was at work on a visit in the shower, you know, but the ones that's really going to carry them knives and tear that motherfucker up, they was on that first wave because I promise you, the way I was taught, I'm about to be on that first wave because I don't want to suffer no repercussions behind you know what this first wave because i'm about to tear this motherfucker up so i'm trying to be on this first wave because i don't want to find out what happens on the second and third because i didn't been in waves where i didn't took off and found out that nobody else took flight and they had action to do it they had action yeah. to do it they're supposed yeah. to come out and continue it but they didn't and i was stuck in the hole real with realizing they ain't handle their business i ain't never i didn't like that feeling and i promise you what? See that, that's see that's the thing though. Um, see these groups they plan everything. They're a lot more prepared. Preparation has a lot to do with it. In my personal opinion, you know what I'm saying? Like we have our squads ready to go, and we're not going to send all our elite soldiers first off the first wave. Like you know how the Nords used to do it. When we had issues, we we're going to send about five heads, <laughs> nice yeah. to go rush, rush about 50, 60 of them. But we're going to key in on key targets, and then we're going to have a second wave fall right behind them. <clears throat> physically, you know what I mean? And the whole, that was a whole numbers game. That was to get rid of all their main targets, right? And then to get as many of them off the yard as we could. So we knew we were going to send like ten. We knew we were going to send about ten and probably lose about ten, right? Yeah. But if we take if we take 50, 60 to the hole, and now that they say they were like one hundred and fifty, now they're ninety, and our numbers were like about seventy. Now the numbers are even now, and we got the second yeah. way to go. Now if yeah, the blacks so would be a little, the blacks don't always prepare for that. That's the thing. And so if you're prepared, you would have your soldiers ready that you're going to send, and you could pre pre prepare a plan of attack. That's the only difference in it. My personal you know, opinion. You know what happened? And this is this might hit home or it might hurt a little, but what happened? Man, those those warriors, those soldiers, those people that played the numbers game, right? Strive for strive with they with their competition, whether it be the northerners, the southerners, the, the Aryans, the whatever. They they playing the numbers game right along with them. What happened over time is that the numbers kind of blew off in the wind and it didn't matter and it became color that's it I'm is, it enough, that. is it enough I'm for it. me is it enough for you is it more of me than it is of you but if the strategy gets lost in that the strategy where knock down send two knock down three or send one knock down five like the mm -hmm. strategy gets lost here's my theory about that in the 80s, even in the early 90s, prison was different. You had a prison would have about, say, even if the northerners were outnumbered, say there could be 300, 400 South Stars on a prison yard and 200 northerners. That was common in the 80s and 90s. They started to make all these new prisons, which spread everybody thin. And then you had a new wave of convicts that were coming in that were just civilians that should never even went to prison. They should have been in the county jail. So now you have, now you, you don't see a yard with about 150, 200 North, North Daniels. Back in the day, Susanville had 200 North Daniels, Tracy's, Solano, all these places. You started having places like Avenal, Pleasant Valley, Corcoran, High Desert. This gave them room to spread everybody out to where the numbers were thin now. That's why the numbers were thin everywhere. Before, there was only about 12 prisons, and the numbers were at least even. To us, if we had 200, they had 300. That was even to us. Yeah. We had no problem with that. You know what I mean? So when they built all these prisons, now you're getting sent to places like Avenal, Pleasant Valley. New Corcoran, Corcoran, and you're on a yard with eight to ten homeboys instead of being on a yard like uh, Tracy or Susanville, where you have about 100, 200 homeboys. Where, where was the Bulldogs in all of this? That was another problem, too, because the Bulldogs were all in Avenal and places like that. You know, about 92, there was that, that complete separation. For a while, they were kind of like, you know, in between on everything. So, like, the politics didn't come, are not as strong back then as they are today. You go to yard and there'd be bulldogs and, and whatnot in the eighties and nineties some places. Okay, and so in so in the eighties, the eighties and the nineties were different. 
what were some differences just between the 80s and 90s? Okay, there was more cars. You know, the, some of the blacks play cars. The Northerns yeah. would play cars. Okay, that's a Stockton car. That's a Soho car. That's a Fresno car. Then that, oh, those dudes are playing politics. That's structure over there. That's how it was all looked. The Hold on, pause, 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 pause. Because this, we just went into a conspiracy theory. Is it card or cars? Cars. Or is that the same thing? A R S, like a car, like you drive. That's your car. For part two. Go to Flacco's channel at Convert's Perspective, ACP 30. Go. For part two, go to Flacco's channel at Convert's Perspective, ACP 30. Go.